Hallelujah. I love that song. I love the whole concept behind it. I won't ask you to raise your hand today, but so this is a rhetorical question. How many of you owe money to the bank? A lot of us, if not most of us do. How great would it be if you got a letter in the mail that said some generous person came in and paid all your debts off, your debt free? Would that, would that spark uh, an excitement in you? You would be grateful for that, that somebody would love you enough to do that for you. And that's literally what Jesus did when he died on the cross for us. We had a sin debt. Right? The Bible te teaches us that the wages of sin is death. Uh, but Jesus came and he paid for our sins. And literally, on the books of heaven where all of our sins are recorded, it says paid in full. Amen? Aren't you thankful for Jesus this morning? Good to have everybody here today. What a great, great looking crowd out here this morning. Thankful for everybody that came to be a part of this service. Um, it's a great time of year. I love this time of year. The uh, dogwoods are blooming. The white bass are running. Turkeys are gobbling, right? I mean, all these things are, are happening. It's beautiful. The flowers are blooming. And, uh, and above all things, we, we are reminded and we focus on the fact that Jesus is alive again. Amen? So we're going to jump into the Word this morning. If you want to open your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 28, that's where we're going to begin here in just a minute or two. Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. So if you were here Friday night for our Good Friday service, obviously we celebrated the death part and then the burial part of Jesus' sacrifice for us. Um, we learned that after being mocked and spit on and whipped and crowned with thorns and nailed to a cross, at that point Jesus is laying in a tomb. One of his disciples at that point is dead. The leader of his disciples has blatantly and publicly denied him repeatedly. The rest of the disciples are all in hiding, fearing for their lives. And the Pharisees... Uh, are celebrating their victory until, look at your neighbor and say until, until, that brings us to the title of our message this morning, three days later. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning as we have already felt your presence today. God, that you're here in spirit, Lord, to touch and to move upon those who will open their hearts to you. We want you to be glorified. We believe that today through the worship, you have already been honored. And we want to continue to do that through your word. Let your word here today, through the anointing power of the Holy Spirit, use this vessel to touch hearts and lives and bring you the glory you deserve. We pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. 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 Three days later. That, that is the victory of Christians. Amen. I said Friday, Friday night that... The death and the burial and resurrection is the foundation of, of our faith. Amen. And uh, so we see where seemingly Jesus is defeated at the cross. But we see today as we celebrate his victory. He very much he was not defeated, but this was all part of his plan. Remember, we read, about, we read that a lot Friday night. Jesus said, these things must happen for the scriptures to be fulfilled. So that brings us to Matthew chapter 28, verse 1, as we see what happened three days later. Now after the Sabbath... Excuse me. After the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. Behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of the guards, tremble. Excuse me. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, "Do not fear. Be afraid. For I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified." Here's the announcement. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. And like Glendella said, obviously, we, that's what we celebrate. You hear that several times throughout this service today. And it's not something, honestly, folks, that should be celebrated one time a year on Easter. We should celebrate the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ throughout the entirety of the year. Every day, really. Amen. That Jesus would do this for us. Luke, in 20, chapter, chapter 24, recruit, records it like this. And as they were frightened, the, the ladies who see the angel, as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee, the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day arise. And they remembered his words. So I like this scripture here. Let's look at this in a couple different ways here today. 
First of all, the question to the angels, from the angels to the ladies that were there is, why, first of all, would you come to a cemetery? Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Ultimately, why would you go to a cemetery and look for somebody who's alive? That, that's a good question. I mean, if I, if I needed to talk to Conger, I wouldn't go out to Pine Grove Cemetery and look around for him, right? You imagine, I'm looking around, I'm wandering around, I'm not seeing, so I call Sarah and I'm like, Sarah, where's, where's Jeff? Well, he's right here at the house. Well, I, can't, I hadn't been able to find him anywhere. Where have you been looking? Out here at the cemetery. That, that wouldn't make any sense. He's alive. Why would he be in the cemetery? Jesus was very much alive, and that's what the angels are asking them. Why would you look in the cemetery for somebody who's alive? Well, you say, well, how were they supposed to know that Jesus was alive? Because he told them he was going to live again. Amen? And that's what I want to talk about here today. Jesus had told the disciples that he would raise again, right? And so uh, you would think, I was thinking about this this morning. I never really thought about it before. That Jesus had told him, he was very upfront with the disciples throughout the entirety of his teaching, especially towards the end there, that he was going to be killed, right? And he also told them, hey, don't despair because that got them all worked up. You're going to die. You know what? He said, but don't let that freak you out too much because I'm only going to stay dead temporarily. Three days, I'm going to raise from the dead. Now, you would think that the disciples would have went to that cemetery and, and like had a tailgate party, right? Wouldn't you think that they would have wanted to be there to witness and see Jesus coming out of the tomb? Why were they not there? Because they didn't fully believe yet. They still had some doubts. They were defeated. Jesus, who they knew to be their Messiah, they were convinced of that. But why is he dead? That doesn't make any sense as to why he would have allowed that to happen. They didn't fully believe just yet. And you know why? Because the resurrection of Jesus is what ultimately makes believers out of us. We see this from the scripture. In John chapter 2 verse 18, it says, The Jews said to him, to Jesus, What sign do you show us for these things that you're doing? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. So Jesus is preaching with authority, ultimately, that the Pharisees are leading people astray and that his way is right. And they say, well, you got to give us a sign. If you want us to believe you and that you are who you say you are, then you need to give us a sign. Jesus said, okay, I'll give you a sign. Tear this temple down, and in three days, I'll build it back up. Well, they thought he was talking about the actual temple. Jesus was referring to the temple of his body, that he would die, and three days later he would return. That's the sign I'm going to give you. Verse, and then Matthew chapter 12, verse 38, he says the same thing. They come back, and some of, them, some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. Again, if you want us to believe who you say you are, give us a sign. But he answered them, an evil and an adulterous generation seeks for a sign. No sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man, that he's referring to himself, will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. I'm not giving, I'm going to, he said, okay, I'm going to give you one sign. I'm going to give you the sign of all signs that I will be dead for three days and then I will live again. And ultimately what Jesus is saying to them is this, if you don't believe that, if you don't believe me because of that, then you're not ever going to believe in me. If you can't believe in me after my resurrection, you're never going to believe in me. Of all the things that Jesus did and the things that he taught, nothing made him believable like his resurrection. Even raising people for other people from the dead. Jesus healed people. He healed the blind. He healed the lame. He healed the lepers. He raised people from the dead. He walked on water. All the things Jesus did as a sign to prove that he was God and they still yet didn't believe. Jesus said the only sign that's really going to make you believe is after you see me die and then you see me live again. That is the sign. It's the resurrection. Hallelujah. Even Jesus predicting his death really didn't make him believable, right? I mean, he made enemies with the people who could have him executed. So it stood to reason, if you make enemies with the people that have you executed, it's no big revelation to say, hey, they're going to kill me, right? Okay, and he predicted that, but even that wasn't enough to make him believable. But not only did Jesus predict his death, he was able to predict his resurrection, Okay, nobody else can do that. And not only did he predict his resurrection, but he pinpointed it down to three days later, right? I'm going to raise from the dead and I can even tell you how many days I'm going to stay dead and when I'm going to come back. That's why it doesn't make any sense really why the disciples weren't out there on that third day. Ready. 
I mean, even the Pharisees put some guards out there because they said, well, this, this deceiver said he was going to raise three days. Let's put some guards out there to keep that from happening. How many of you know you can't stop God from doing what God wants to do, right? Hallelujah. Even Jesus' own brother, James, didn't believe in Jesus and who he was until after the resurrection, according to Scripture. Think about this. James, Jesus' own brother, didn't buy it. We see one place in scripture where Jesus was ministering and his brothers, his family came to him and they're trying to stop him. They think, they're like, this guy's he's going to make a fool out of himself. His own brother didn't believe that he was who he said he was. I can't help but believe that at some point James didn't see some of the things that Jesus was able to do. But according to scripture, we'll see here in a minute, Jesus, it specifically says that Jesus revealed himself to James. And James became one of the greatest leaders in the church. In fact, if you read the book of James in the Bible, you'll never guess who wrote that. James, right? The brother of Jesus. It took the resurrection. He saw his brother die. He saw them put him in a grave. And then he saw him later very much alive. Made a believer out of him. His disciples didn't even believe the report of his resurrection. Right? They, these, these folks, they had a hard time. They struggled with believing until they saw him themselves. Remember, because Mary, uh, the, the ladies who saw the angels and said that, the, they heard the report, he's risen from the dead. And they went back and, and they told the disciples, Jesus is alive again. And the disciples didn't even believe the report, even though Jesus had already told them. But after they saw Jesus for themselves, then they believed. And it was in that moment that they were able to even put their own life on the line. Think about it. As they all ran scared, the disciples all ran scared when Jesus was taken away and he was crucified. But after the resurrection and ultimately the infilling of the Holy Spirit, which came after the resurrection, after they really truly, the Bible says that Jesus met with them after his resurrection and then he really began to explain the scriptures to them and then they began to understand. Now these same men who had ran for their life scared were now willing to put their life on the line and they did. Every one of them gave their life for preaching the gospel. They were so confident in who Jesus, that, that Jesus was who he said he was that they literally gave their life. Some of them were dismembered, literally ripped from limb. Some of them were beheaded. Some of them were hung. Gave their life. Why? Because they said, we saw him die and then we saw him come back to life again. No doubt in their minds that he was who he said he was. Hallelujah. <clears throat> There's no other religion that has ever been in, during the history of mankind that can celebrate the resurrection of its originator, right? Muhammad, Buddha, you name it. All of the people who established religions that we see throughout the world, none of them can claim that they, came back, that they could come back from the dead. The objects of their worship were mere men, didn't have the power to live again, Right? And Jesus even said, if you remember, Jesus even said, hey, look, guys, there's going to be other people coming to this earth. They're going to come claiming to be me. Jesus was declaring himself to be the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. But he said, be aware, there's going to be a lot of people come claiming to be me. Well, then how are we really going to know whether you're the right one? Or how are we going to know if these guys, how are we going to know that they're not the real Messiah? Well, you just ask yourself one question. Can they raise themselves from the dead? Anybody can come claiming to be something, but can they put their, put, can they put their power where their mouth is? Can they raise themselves from the dead? Nobody else has ever been able to do that. Jesus has been the only person in human history that's been able to raise himself from the dead. And not only did he live again, but he's lived forever, the Bible says. Amen? Revelation chapter 1, verse 17 says, and when I saw him, this is, this is John having a revelation of the risen Christ on the island of Patmos. John, John writes this. When I saw him, and I saw Jesus, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives. I was dead. And behold, I am alive. How long? Forevermore. I'm alive. I died. I came back to life. And I'm going to live forever. Jesus will never die again. Think about that. Now, throughout scripture, there are other accounts in scripture where people were resurrected from the dead. Okay, they died and they came back to life again. Several places in scripture. Uh, there was the man, uh, if you recall, and this is back in the Old Testament, somewhere around 1 Kings, 2 Kings, I forget which. But uh, there was a man by the name of Elijah, who was a great prophet of God. And 
or was it Elisha? It's Elijah or Elisha. I always get those two guys mixed up. But they, anyway, he died and had been put, you know, in a, in a grave. Well, years later, I mean, Elisha has already decayed, or Elijah, whichever one it was, has already decayed, and it's just his bones there now. So flash forward several years, and there's this army, there's this battle going on, and there's this guy that's been killed. And so his buddies are all burying him, and as they're getting ready to bury him, they see an army coming against them, and they're like, ditch him! And they just throw him in the, the tomb, or they throw him in the hole, and so that they can go fight the enemy. They throw this dead guy in the hole and his body rolls up against the bones of Elijah or Elisha, whoever it was. And when his bones, when he rolled up against his bones, he came back to life. We, we read that. That literally happened in scripture. Can you imagine what that would have been like? As you were the guys, he's dead. They throw him in, they go to fight and this guy pops back up out of the hole with his sword and he's ready to fight. We see the widow's son that was the, the widow uh, whose son had passed away and there's a big funeral procession. They're taking him to the cemetery. Jesus walks up, he touches the casket and the guy comes to life again. There's J. Iris' daughter who was officially dead. Jesus goes in, raises her from the dead. Lazarus, we all know about Lazarus, right? Who was dead for four days. Jesus rose him from the dead. So plenty of times in scripture where somebody died and, and was resurrected, but all of those people died again at some point. Nobody has ever risen from the dead and stayed alive except Jesus. He died. He said, I rose again, and now I'm alive forever. Glendale quoted the scripture a minute ago where now he sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you and for me. Hallelujah. There's only one that has ever risen from the dead and stayed alive permanently. In Hebrews chapter 7, it says the, the former priests, and this was speaking of the priests back in the Old Testament law, were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. And just simply put this, back in the Old Testament under the law, the Levites, they were the priests. They were the ones that ultimately handled, you know, the church work, if you will, the sacrifices and all that kind of stuff. But none of those priests could serve in the capacity of a priesthood permanently. You know why? Because they were all human. I'm, I'm never going to, I can't serve in this role as pastor permanently. You know why? Because I'm a human and one day I'm going to die. Somebody else is going to have to do it. So the priests were the same way. They would serve as priests until they died. Somebody else would serve as priests until they died and so on and so forth. But, so he, but he goes on to say, but we have the great high priest, Jesus. Then when he died on the cross, he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Jesus is, literally the priest was the link from man to God. If you wanted to get a hold of God, you went and found a priest. We don't, need, we don't do that anymore. We don't have to go to a man and find that link. Jesus is our link to God. We pray, we go to God through Jesus Christ and he's permanently alive, which means therefore he's permanently our high priest. Hallelujah. It says, consequently he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them, for us. Jesus is always alive. He's always listening. Just as his death, just as his death on the cross guarantees our salvation. We've talked about that. His death on the cross guarantees our salvation if we believe, right? You have to believe. You have to put your faith in the fact that Jesus died for your sins. If you don't believe, then it does you no good. His death on the cross guarantees our salvation from sin if we believe. And in the same way, his resurrection guarantees our resurrection if we believe. We all know we're going to die someday. You want a guarantee of resurrection to live with God forever? Jesus is our guarantee. The fact that he rose from the dead and what we celebrate today is a guarantee that one day we also will raise from the dead. Romans chapter 8 verse 11 says this. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and he does, if you're a Christian, if you're a child of God, when you have put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and received him in your life as Savior, repented of your sins, God's spirit dwells in you. That's how you're saved. That's how you know that, that Jesus is who he said he is because the spirit reveals that to you. The spirit of God abides within us. So he says, if the spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. What does that mean? It means when this mortal body, you know what mortal means? It means it can die. This body is mortal. It can, it can die. And so when this mortal body dies, since the spirit of God dwells in me, that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will also raise me from the dead. Death is not final. It's not the end of me or anybody for that matter. Hallelujah. 
The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead that we celebrate now is going to raise me in that same manner. Not in this same type body, in a glorified body as Jesus had. We'll talk about that here in just a minute. 1 Thessalonians, look at here, if this don't get you excited, nothing will. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep or those who have died. Paul is writing this letter to new Christians, right? All they know really at this point is that Jesus is their Savior. They've put their faith in him and their sins are gone. But they're still trying to learn how all this goes. And Paul says, look, I want you to understand ultimately what Paul is saying is this. I want you to understand what happens to you when you die. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope, right? So Christians view death much differently than unbelievers do. An unbeliever looks at death as, as finality, as no hope, it's over, right? But we as Christians, we know that once when we die, we know that there, our hope lies beyond death. Says the, in fact, Paul writes somewhere else, and we'll read this scripture probably in a minute too, but he says, if in this life only we have hope, we're of all men most miserable. We have hope beyond this life. So he, Paul's saying, I don't want you to sorrow as other people sorrow. Even in death, I want you to realize that there's hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we do, that's what we're celebrating here today. If you believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus, or those who have died with Jesus as their Savior. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God. And look at here. The dead in Christ will rise first. If the spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he will also raise your mortal bodies on that day that Jesus returns. <laughs> Hallelujah. The dead in Christ will rise. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we shall always be with the Lord, therefore comfort one another with these words. And that's the purpose of this message. It's the purpose of Easter. It's the message of Easter, of hope and comfort. Can you imagine the scene? To be in a graveyard on the day, in the moment that Jesus comes, that trumpet sounds and graves literally burst open. And those who have been dead for years and centuries who had put their trust in Jesus be res resurrected just as Jesus was 2,000 years ago. It's going to happen. This is not a fairy tale. This is not a, 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 an ideal or, a, theolo, you know, or a, a, a theory. It's a reality that one day will actually take place. The dead will rise again. And here's, a, here's even better news. Just as Jesus di died and just as he uh, came alive again and is alive forevermore, we get to share in that exact same promise. Once we are resurrected and live again, we will live forevermore. Amen? Don't have to die twice. If you know Jesus, I won't get into all of this, but the, the Bible talks about that second death. See, this is the only, the only time, the only way this is good news is if you know Jesus as your Savior, right? Because the Bible talks about the second death. So in other words, if we're all going to die once, we know that in, in, in the flesh, our body. We're resurrected into life if we know Jesus and we spend eternity. But the Bible goes on to talk about the second death. That's for people who re reject Jesus. And they die literally forever, this torment uh, in hell forever. It's a horrible thought. And so Jesus said, look, I don't want you to go there. I don't want Jesus, I don't want anybody to go there. I want everybody to live forever with me in eternity. That's why Jesus died on the cross, so that we could escape all of that. Hallelujah. I want you to turn with me into 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll work our way through this chapter here just real quickly. Paul writing, this is now to a, a different church. Paul's writing to about the resurrection. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's read about the first seven verses here. Let's begin with. Paul says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. In other words, everything you believe and everything that you're linked to God ultimately is all wrapped up in this. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you unless you believed in vain. Here's what it all boils down to. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared after he, was, after he resurrected. People saw him. 
He appeared to Cephas, which was Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. In other words, you know, he, he appeared to a lot of people. And look, mo- some of them have died, but most of them are still alive. Go and ask them. Go and ask them. They'll testify. Think about how many people here, what, I haven't done the math, 500, you know, what is it, 560 or 70 some odd people just in this record that seen Jesus uh, alive again after his death. And now there are multi- multiple a gazillion people who are believers in Jesus Christ because these people saw him alive and made that eyewitness report. So then he goes on to say, even he appeared to James then to all the, and to the, all the apostles. You go down into chapter, to verse 12. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? So apparently there's this rumor flying around the Corinthian church where somebody's just saying, yeah, there's no resurrection. You believe in Jesus, he died for your sins, but once you're dead, you're dead. It's over. There's people who believe that, right? It's just, this is, this is it. This is it. Just this life, and once you die, you cease to exist. Absolutely not true. That is not true in any way, shape, or form. We live forever, one way or the other. We are eternal beings. Our bodies are temporary beings, but our spirit within us is eternal. We live forever, somewhere, either heaven or in hell. So this rumor, I guess, that got started around the church that, oh, there's no resurrection. Even Christians say, oh, there's no resurrection. Once you die, you die. And, and Paul's saying, no, no, that's not true at all. If there was no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. I'm going to put it to you this way. Who cares who Jesus is if we don't raise from the dead after we die? What's the point? I mean, if there's no resurrection, live however you want to. Why would Jesus have come and died on the cross to save us from our sins if we're just going to die and cease to exist anyway? That doesn't even make any sense, Paul's saying. Of course you resurrect after you die. You resurrect either either to life or you resurrect unto eternal death. There is a resurrection, and Jesus' resurrection is proof of that. He goes on a little further. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and so is your faith. We are even... Let's see here. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testify about God that he has raised Christ, whom, he did, whom uh, he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, it's vain, it's meaningless, and, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep or have died in Christ, they perished. I mean, they're just in the grave. Not, nothing happened. And if, if in Christ, and I quoted this verse a minute ago, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. In other words, so if we rejoice that Jesus died for our sins, but once this life is over, it's over, then we don't have anything more to look forward to than the rest of the world and the unbelievers, Right? For as man came by, excuse me, for as by man uh, came death, by man has also come the resurrection of the dead. Everybody who came from the lineage of Adam, everybody in this room that, that was basically uh, born from the lineage of Adam, in other words, you could trace your, his, your ancestry all the way back to Adam, raise your hand. That's everybody, amen? Everybody we trace back to Adam. So at, where did our death sin nature come from? One man. Adam sinned, and so therefore every human being ever after has sinned. And because Adam died because of his sin, every human being after has died from their sin. But because of one man, we have the promise of eternal life. That one man, Jesus. But, in, uh, see, but, but each in his own order, I love this, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Jesus. Jesus is the first fruits, meaning he is the first person to raise from the dead and stay alive, and therefore everybody who follows him will join the same. Let's go down to verse number 35. It says, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You feel this person. What, what you sow or what you plant does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but the bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. In other words, put it to you this way. He goes on to talk later about the different types of bodies, the heavenly bodies and the, and the earthly bodies and so on and so forth. But in order for one certain, a type of body to change into another type of body, there's a death that has to take place. Here's, here's the example Paul's using. Let's use, the, let's use a, a grain of, uh, a kernel of corn. Okay, it's a seed. So if, you, if I was holding up a kernel of corn, that's one form. Okay, that kernel, that's the form currently is the kernel of corn. But if I plant it and I put it in the ground, it then germinates and it comes up out of the ground and turns into a stalk, 
which is another form. The only way, how many of you like corn on the cob? I love, it's, it's almost time for corn on the cob. And I don't know that I can bear this out scriptural, but I think it's scriptural for, for you to tithe your corn. Uh, bring it to the storehouse. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm just teasing. But still. Uh, I do love corn on the cob for those of you that have any excess. But if you want, if you want corn on the cob, you have to plant the corn in the ground. What Paul is using that as an example is this. We all want that glorified body. We don't know exactly what the glory, in other words, when we resurrected the glorified body, meaning it's not a body like the one we have now. It's not, it will, it'll be a body that won't bleed, it won't hurt, it won't have pain, and it'll never die. And we, in our mind, can't quite fathom, we don't know exactly what that body's going to be like, but hey, I, I'm kind of looking forward to it. Every morning when I get up and my back hurts, I'm looking forward to the glorified body. But there's no, I can't possibly get that glorified body until this one is put in the ground. This is one form. This is the kernel of corn. And if I'm going to get that glorified body, I first have to die and be planted in the ground. The hope is the resurrection. Hallelujah. It's all about the resurrection. We live way too much for this life that is all going to end the, the moment we die. Everything I've attained, meaningless, the second I die. But if I'm living for that resurrection, now I've got something to look forward to. It's a reality. Hallelujah. If you want to live again, you got to die first. But before you die, you got to make sure you've made preparations. Right? You have to have turned your life over to Jesus in order to become the stalk of corn, if you will. Let's look at this, this a little further here in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 42. So, so it is with the resurrection of the dead, what is sown or what is planted is perishable, but what is raised is imperishable. This body that goes in the ground, it can perish, obviously, but the one that raises will never perish again. It is sown in dishonor. Let me tell you something. When you put me in the ground, there's a lot of dishonor associated with this form. I've committed a lot of sins. I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. And so when I'm planted in the ground, even though I'm a pastor, I'm still planted in dishonor. Because there was things, I've done things, said things throughout my life that dishonored God. So we're planted or we're buried in dishonor, but we're raised in glory. Hallelujah. That once we're raised and resurrected, the old sins of the past are no longer to be remembered. Now we are in literally, we are literally in the likeness of God. The Bible teaches us this. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know this, that when he appears, we shall be like him. We shall see him as he is and we shall be like him. In his resurrection. This body is sown or planted in weakness. It's raised in power. It's going down to verse number 50. I tell you this brothers. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. In other words I can't go to heaven in this body. Nor does the perishable inher inherit imperishable. Behold I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. But we shall all be changed. There will be some alive when Jesus returns. That's what we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. When Jesus comes... There'll be a lot of people dead, obviously, but there's going to be, I mean, the world's still going to be operating. It's still going to be going. There's going to be people who are alive. And I like it where it says that the, those who are alive will not go before those who have died in Christ. Those who are still, in other words, if we're here today and the Lord comes in this moment and we're alive, we stand here and we get to watch the resurrection of all those who have died before us in Christ. Amen? That may not excite you, but it does me. I'd like to be in the, I'd like to be in the, in the cemetery by the time that comes. Amen? Okay, here it is, verse 51. I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Look at this. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishable. This mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. The only thing that can conquer death, none of us will beat death, right? Because we're all going to die. Death wins against everybody. The only thing that beats death is resurrection. Hallelujah. The only thing that beats death is resurrection. And the only way to have resurrection is to follow the only one who has ever resurrected and stayed alive forever. Amen? Oh, death, where's your, where's your victory? Death, where's your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ who resurrected. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing 
that your la- that the that the Lord, excuse me, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Guys, be move, be immovable, steadfast. A burnt, and what he's saying here is this: keep trusting Jesus. Are there questions? Sure. Can I stand up here and answer every question you have about God? I cannot do it. I wish I could. Can I explain why bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people? I can't. We don't know. We don't understand everything there is to know about God and about this life. But I know this, according to Scripture, that when this life is over and we're resurrected with Jesus, it's all going to make a lot more sense. So though I don't know and I can't answer every single question, I know enough to know that he's worth following. I know enough to know that Jesus is worth giving my life to and putting my trust in so that I press through the challenges and the hardships and the questions that we have in life. Immovable, he said. Steadfast, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Just keep following Jesus. When it gets hard, when you get tempted to quit, think about him coming out of that grave. Think about the promise. He's the first fruits of the resurrection. That means since his spirit dwells in me, I'm going to live again To It's worth waiting for. Amen? All good things are worth waiting for. Philippians chapter 3 verse 7, Paul writes this. I'm bringing us in for a landing here. Whatever gain I had, Paul says, in other words, whatever I've accomplished in this life, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. King James, King James says, like, it's like dung in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Now look at this. Paul says, in other words, nothing in this life really means anything to me anymore. This is what matters, Paul says, that I may know him, Christ, and the power of his resurrection. That's all that matters. And share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection of the dead. If I'm going to share... In the resurrection of Jesus, I must first share in the crucifixion of Jesus. In other words, you can't have Easter until you first have a Good Friday. Amen? We can't share in the... Paul talks a lot about, talks a lot about you know, Jesus even talking about how we must die to ourselves. Jesus said it like this. Um, he said, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. We have to have that moment, that Good Friday moment, where we... We crucify self. We die to self. Our own will and our own goals and our own way of living. We, we put all that aside in order to share in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're resurrected. When you become a Christian, folks, the Bible teaches us that we, are, we, bec- uh, we begin to walk in the newness of life. We literally, literally are a new creature. There's kind, of a, there's kind of a spiritual resurrection and then a literal resurrection. When you give your life to Jesus, the old man dies. You're, you're resurrected into a, a new creature. And then when that happens, we get to share in the literal, physical resurrection in the end. Last verse here, John chapter 11, verse 23. Jesus, this is after, he, after his friend Lazarus had died, and he's speaking to Lazarus' sister, who was pretty upset. Lord, have you, had you come sooner, you could have prevented Lazarus from dying. And Jesus said, that's not what I wanted to do. He, Jesus waited on purpose two days until Lazarus was dead, and then he went. He wanted Lazarus to die so that he could show his power of resurrection. This is what Jesus says to Martha. Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, well, I know he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. I am. That's present tense. Jesus didn't say, well, I will be the resurrection. Yes, I will. Her her, her hope was all, you know, in the future. Yeah, I know you'll raise him again at the last day. In other words, you know, when you come back and stuff. And Jesus said, no, I'm not, it's not just I will be the resurrector. I am the resurrection. Right now, currently, he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he asked Mary, or this Martha, this very important question. Do you believe this? Martha, I am the resurrection in the, do- in the life. Death is not final with me. When someone dies in me, I can make them live again. Do you believe this? Of course, we know the rest of the story. Jesus walked to the grave of Lazarus and said, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus rose from the dead. Jesus showed that he is and was and always will be the resurrection. So my question to you is the same that Jesus asked Martha. 
All that I said here this morning declaring Jesus to be the Son of God, the Messiah who died on the cross of Calvary so that you could be free from your sins. The, the, the payment for your sin could be taken care of. You put your faith in him, he will save you, he will cleanse you of your sin. And you never have to worry about standing before God to answer for your sins. You've put all of your sin under, under Jesus' care, under his blood. Do you believe that? I asked you the question he asked Mary. When I say to you this morning that they buried Jesus, but three days later, according to scripture, and according to a lot of people who saw him after he was, had risen again, do you believe this? Do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection? Do you believe that he's coming back again, that one day you and I and everybody who has ever lived will stand before him and be judged for the lives that we live? I believe that. Amen. One of the things that Jesus made very clear throughout his ministry, he, made, he, he preached and declared himself to be who he is, and he basically just asked the question, who do you believe that I am? Do you believe me? So I wonder this morning, as we just kind of come to this place where the rubber meets the road, okay, you've just heard a sermon. You can walk away from here today saying, I heard a sermon today. It's a speech, a lecture, if you will. But if this morning... As you're listening to this and something is poking you on the inside, something stirring you on the inside, it's more than just a sermon, but you felt this morning today that God was drawing you, that God was talking to you, that God was showing you that this is truth. Maybe you've never really experienced it before as truth. And God's dealing with you today to come to him, to receive his offer of salvation to be forgiven for your sins, and to share in this great hope of resurrection. If this morning the thought of dying lost, the thought of hell, and separation from God worries you, there's no reason to leave here with that worry. Jesus paid all of this for you individually to be saved and have the peace of God that passes all understanding. To leave here today knowing... Uh, I don't have to worry about death anymore. I used, before I got saved, I used to always worry about death. I'd be out in the woods hunting. I'd be thinking about all those bullets going through the woods. Because I, I knew I wasn't the only person out there hunting. There's a lot of people out there hunting. What if a stray bullet? I worried about that because I knew I wasn't ready to stand before God. Swimming in a creek. Get to worrying about the cotton mouths. Okay, I'm saved. I still worry about the cotton mouths. But... Not in the sense that I'm afraid to die necessarily. But I worried about that. I worried about that because I, I knew that if, I, if, if, if a cotton mouth got me and I died, I, I, I wasn't ready to stand before God. I don't want to die. I'm not looking for, you know, but I'm not scared of it. I'm not scared of it anymore. So if, if the fear of death is still there, understand here today that Jesus can take that fear of death away from you. Make you a new creature. Give you a new life. Give you the promise of heaven. And all it requires of you is that this spark that you have, this drawing that you have, act on it with your faith. Lord, I believe. I believe this. this is, I believe that this is truth. And you just call out to the Lord and you say, Lord, I'm sorry for my sins. I believe this. Thank you for dying on that cross for me. I accept it. I will follow you. From here on, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to learn of you. I'm going to follow you. And I thank you that I have the promise that I can now share in the resurrection. That's all it takes. That's all there is to it. Going from being lost to being saved. Amen. Would you bow with me this morning, ladies, if you come to the piano today? Let Jesus in this morning. They're going to sing a song today. We're going to take just a little bit of time to let everybody kind of reflect on your own personal life. I don't know where you stand with God. There's no way that I possibly can. But if God's dealing with you today, this is the moment to take care of business. We, we come to the Lord as he's drawing us. And that's what this part of the invitation is all about. It's the opportunity for God to, he's, already, he's revealed truth to you. This is the opportunity where you can now accept it. The altars are open. I mean, it, it, what I mean by that is if, if, if you want to come this morning and, and, and you say, I just, I need you to pray with me. I need you to walk me through this. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. And you want us to pray with you through that. We love to do that. We're glad to do that. In fact, I'm going to ask everybody to stand and just respect this morning. Come and we will pray with you. 
But it's not just about you coming forward. It's about you coming to Jesus. Acting, acting on the faith that God has given you. The Bible says that God has given every single person a measure of faith. Meaning this, I believe, that everybody has enough faith to be saved. God's not going to reveal to you every single question that you have. Right now, you just act on this tiny, this one truth that Jesus is, was, and always will be who he said he is. Respond to that today and let him in. You pray, you talk to him like you would be talking to me or something. Think about the, the person that you are the closest to in your life. The person that you can open up to and that you can say anything to. Jesus is closer to you than that. You can say anything to him. Lord, I've, I've sinned. I've committed this sin. I've struggled with this my whole life. I worry that I'll never get you. Just speak to him like you would the, most, the person that you're most comfortable with. And understand and believe here today that he's listening. And if you open up and you receive him in, he will come in. He promises that he would. He will save you and you can boldly declare here today, I am saved. I am a child of God. I do have the blood of Jesus applied to my life as we talked about Friday night. And praise God, I have confidence today that I will take part in that resurrection. As they sing this morning, would you pray, would you, would you cry out to God this morning?